Tervetuloa viimeiseen, viimeiseen tota, Infratrackin ää, tota, sessioon. Tämä on, tämä on kohtuullisen avoin sessio. Mulla on toki valmisteltu asioita tässä, tässä taustalla panelistien kesken, haettu vähän ää, näkökulmia tähän tota, ajankohtaiseen teemaan. Ää, tota, jotta me päästään vähän tutustumaan, että ketä täällä oikein on. Ensinnäkin mä olen Reima Riku ja toimin ratkaisuarkkitehtinä. Windows Asuren parissa ja on ollut tässä, tässä Tech Days 2013 tapahtumassa tämän Infratrackin isäntänä suurimman osan aikaa, aina, aina välillä piipahtunut vähän muuallakin, mutta lähdetään liikkeelle pilvipaneelin osallistujista. Meillä on täällä tota, kohtuullisen raskasta kalustoa ja tota, kunhan saisi tuota, let's see if the technology actually works, hold on a second, do have a time? Demo-efekti paneeli. Yes, demo-efekti paneeli, joo. There we go. No. 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 Transition. Nice car. Yeah. Not mine. Does that help? That helps. Oh, oh. There we go. So we have uh, a bunch of panelists. Uh, you've, you've seen them on stage, at least uh, a few of us. And, uh, and uh, to kick things off, uh, I'll let uh, each one of you take uh, a couple of seconds to sort of introduce yourself and, and your relationship to the cloud. The cloud is the current topic of uh, this. Barry, you want to start? So I'm Kimo Burgess. I'm an enterprise architect with Microsoft Services. And one of the things that I've been working on for the past two years is, is private cloud, mostly with, with some of our partners. I know it scratches on my beard. I'm not going to go and shave now. I'm kind of wondering, where did you get that picture? LinkedIn is uh, very interesting. I'll change it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my name is Jaakko Elovara. I'm heading the cloud services as it, uh, at Itela Information uh, and uh, Opus Capita, which was acquired by Itela Information in 2011. I'm Jeff Woolsey. I'm a principal program manager in the Windows Server and Cloud Division. I've been working on virtualization, uh, hypervisor for 10 years at Microsoft and another 10 plus years before that. So I've been doing this for quite a while. Hi, my name is Pekka. It looks like that I'm in the wrong place oh, because sorry. I'm missing over there. But, but I'm working as a CTO at, at Onrego and, and actually we are serving, we are giving you management as a service from our own cloud. So I'm also in cloud business. All right, and uh, my name is Sami Tähtinen. I'm the CTO in a company called You're Ready. Uh, we are building basically application integration from cloud. So integrating on-premise cloud and partner applications to uh, another cloud platform. And I'm Juhani Vuorio, working for Microsoft as a technology evangelist for Windows Azure. And I've been working for Microsoft for quite many years, so I know one of the early days of server and uh, everything above that. So you can basically ask these guys anything. Um, of course, this is an open forum. So any questions that uh, you might have in, in, in the uh, audience, uh, I, got, I got this cube that I can throw at you so you can actually ask the question. Uh, but we have prepared, uh, ouch. We have, we have prepared some, uh, some topics. And uh, since we have a, a pretty uh, diverse set of, set of backgrounds uh, on the panel, uh, the first topic that we thought we'd touch on, and now you guys spending two days at Tech Days, you might have your own opinion, but uh, we'd like to start with a question about the cloud. What is it? What is the cloud? Any, any, any takers? Well, I'm going to go ahead and, and start with, with uh, something I, I discussed in the keynote and kind of how we think about the cloud. Um, we know that, you know, there's a lot of people that ask me very, very commonly, I have virtualization, do I have the cloud? Virtualization we see is a very key component to it, but it's more than that. It's being able to de decouple physical resources into virtualized resources, whether those are storage, whether those are networking, whether those are um, memory and compute and be able to, to pool these and then dynamically and allocate these. We want to be able to do this elastically. We want to be able to do this, of course, with multi-tenancy in mind. We certainly think of this as um, 
uh, being able to provide an efficiency greater than just being doing all this on physical machines or being able to do this, you know, with simply virtualization. Um, one of the things I, I always like to point out is, you know, virtualization began as an outgrowth of, of reducing the server sprawl that we were seeing in the 90s and the early part of the, the 2000, uh, um, 2000 decade. And it's moving to a much more, a, a much more automated style, an autom a, a management that allows me to manage pools of resources and be able to automate this and scale this in a way that I don't have to have IT for every server and IT for um, you know, every workload out there. What I really want to do is define a policy and resources for an application and let it dynamically and elastically expand based on its usage and, and needs and try and remove uh, you know, a, lot of, a lot of the you know, day to day, hand to hand operations of let's go make changes to a workload. Um, and then there's a question of where you want to run it. There's the whole private versus public versus service provider. And you know, I, I know early on a lot of everyone got kind of got tripped on what is a private cloud versus a public cloud, and, and there were lots of different terminologies being thrown out there. But you know, you have to decide what makes sense for you from a business perspective, um, whether it's you know running it yourself in, on your own premises, whether it's running it with a service provider, whether it's taking advantage of Microsoft's offering. It's obviously making sure that you have to meet your own business compliance regulatory reasons and needs out there and requirements. So it's really understanding those. Um, I, I talk to people who think I'm going to just tell them, hey, throw everything on Azure or throw everything in a private cloud. Or There's no one size fits all answer. And, for, and what's great about that is it gives you the ability to do what makes best sense for you. For example, if you really decide that you want to build an application that scales around the world, you can do that. You can take advantage of cloud resources that can do that. If you want to run it yourself because you need to maintain tight control, you can do that. But it's about understanding what the, the, the attributes of cloud, the elasticity, the self-provisioning, you know, things like that that are key to being successful. Uh, Jeff had, I, I think, pretty technical point of view. Uh, and I, I myself, I, I think that at for me as a customer, I, I, I think cloud is some, it's, it's a service which comes from the Ethernet cable. I, I really like to see it that way. And, 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 and of course, I understand in, in visualization we had these multi-layers and different kind of things, but, but actually I, I really like to see cloud as a just great service which comes very easily to me. I have the very same opinion, so I think that uh, for me the cloud is software as a service. So I don't need to know where it's running. I don't need to think about the, all the ugly details about the servers. Uh, I don't need, need, even need to know where, where it is physically hosted. And uh, I think that, that that's the same perspective that you have. But from the other, uh, other perspective, like the software developer perspective that I'm also looking at, uh, I think that the cloud is a big enabler for small software companies like us to really leverage the best of breed uh, hardware uh, platform, platform as a service, which makes us, uh, which gives us way, way more possibilities to really create something that simply wasn't possible some 10, 15 years ago. No need to invest uh, from the front end up fees to different kinds of infrastructure services. So I think that the cloud is an enabler from my perspective. Yeah, I would agree also with, with Sami here. I, I think that I'm looking at it uh, from the ISVs or the software vendors perspective and I, I think it's, it's kind of a cost-effective infrastructure where you can rely on it and uh, basically push all the issues around the security, scalability, and all this kind of stuff to somebody who takes care of that with the bigger investments that you could do by yourself. And uh, of course, the aim is to, to try to serve the end customers with a, with a more cost-effective and better platform. Mm. Now, if I want to uh, say a simple version of my view is that uh, cloud is for information technology, technology uh, as the same as the uh, wall socket is for electricity. You pay only wa for what you use. Well, I mean, the, the IT on demand, I mean, you have, you have, if you go back like 10, 15 years, everybody was talking about you know, pay per use capacity, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like you were saying, you know, uh, 
basically like a, like a tap, you, you get water, you get IT. Is that now a, rela a reality with the cloud? Well, what, what's great about this is, is if you ask different people, you get a different answer and you're usually all going in the same direction, but it depends on the func what, the per what the function is of that person. If you ask a CXO, you know, a CTO, whatever, what they think of the cloud, they think of is, it's a real, it's a great way to use my resources super efficiently and I can just go, go based on demand. If you ask a system administrator or an IT pro what it is, it's about, they think architectural and they think, well, this is about creating this, this substrate of virtualized infrastructure that I can put resources on top of and I can put workloads and I can highly standardize them to use it that way. If you're a developer, you're thinking about it in a different way. So it, that's, what's, that's what's really great, but it is, I, I agree with every, what everyone has said, it is about enabling, uh, is an enabling technology, and it is about speed. There is a huge agility that you get with taking advantage of, of cloud. Um, you know, the fact, that, the fact that you used to go out and, you know, I talk to customers and say, yeah, I used to go out and buy servers, and that meant I'd go to the IT department, and we'd sit down and we'd tell them what we need, and six months later, maybe we actually get the services. Now it's like, no, I need a whole bunch of VMs, so I'm just gonna go spin them up, and, and, and there they are, I'm ready to go in you know, hours or even minutes. So definitely usage-based, consumption-based, very much part of, the, part of the equation as well. Uh, Barra, you have, you've been involved in a lot of uh, customer projects. How, how, how mature are, are customers uh, in the Finnish market specifically, or if you, if you compare it to uh, perhaps other, other countries? How, how, mature, how mature is the cloud discussion? I don't know how mature it is, but, but I think it, there's kind of two points here that I think are very important that were kind of alluded in the discussion. One is that you should ask yourself the question, what is the cloud for me? And then make sure that you have the same terminology. You're talking about things with the same terminology as whoever you're talking with. Like if, if you look at the market, that there's, there's all kinds of vendors. There's Microsoft and there's other vendors as well, I suppose, in the, the market for cloud. And, and we all tend to talk about the cloud in our own terminology. We, we, we may be talking about a slightly different thing, but using the same terminology. So I, I, I don't know how mature things are, but, but I think one of the things that you should do before you even start thinking about the cloud, you should make sure that you understand what it means to you, and then when having a discussion with somebody else, a vendor or, or whoever, um, you, sh you should make sure that your terminology matches their terminology so that you're talking about the same things with the same terms. Yeah, so calibrating the discussion, basically. Exactly. That, that's one important thing, I, I, I think, when it comes to, to discussing about the cloud. The second thing that, that's important when, when, you, when you discuss about the cloud is before you get into the, the technologies and whatnots and virtualization and blah, blah, blahs, I think you should think about what is it that I want to achieve? What, are, what, what should the benefits be for me before I start, start uh, having a discussion about moving my whatever services into the cloud? I think that's an important thing. That's what people tend to forget in a lot of the discussions that I've had uh, with customers and with partners as well, is that they, they tend to, for, cloud is the hype word of, of today. But they don't know why they want it. Exactly. They, they, don't want, they don't know why they would like it. We just need to have the cloud because everybody's talking about it. Everybody's in the cloud. We need to be there as well. Do we? Well, let's determine that first before we start having the discussion. Isn't, isn't that a traditional IT thing? Like, we want the latest and greatest and... It's the latest and, uh, buzzword. And, sure. and, you, and you switch what you already have to the latest and greatest of, of the same thing. And uh, I mean that, that's, that's one of the... If you, if you look at, uh, say, for instance, your, your own IT vendors, uh, service providers and, and all of your technology partners, if you're always asking for the same thing, most likely you, you'll get something of, of, of a similar nature. So you have to start looking at it from a, from a totally different angle. So. I would like to add also to Barra's comment here that uh, I, I spent almost five years in, in, in the States and a lot of work in the front line with the customers. And I think that there's a kind of a trend that this kind of B2C user experience 
is coming to B2B side as well. So, you know, whether it's cloud or it's a hosted service or whatever, one element that shows it, of course, is the cost efficiency, that how much are the customers willing to pay for these services, and they see that there is a competitor, a competitor with a true cloud solution, and then you have somebody with the old old kind of, you know, architecture on, on, on premise or hosted or something that is definitely shown in the price of these services as well and, and the flexibility and the kind of usage of new technology. And your, your terminology point was a good one because I, I have to say one thing that we've been seeing a lot of is that there's a term called cloud washing where literally everyone is out there claiming that they're selling cloud when they're selling web, web, web pages. I, I'm, I'm just, it's, it baffles me and it, I get it, look, there's a difference when you sell web pages and when you sell cloud services, you can charge a lot more. I get that. But it means you actually have to offer those cloud services and sell those cloud services. I was seeing an alarming rate of people saying they're doing cloud and it's really, oh yeah, it's IAS or it's Apache. And I'm like, you're selling web services. This is not cloud. Please stop this. And, and some of the analysts that are starting to call, call uh, service providers on this and say, no, be, be clear, be specific about what you offer. But you do need to have that terminology discussion and just make sure you, you level set. Another, another example of the cloud washing eye is in the enterprise applications. So you've been building some ERP or whatever system for 10, 15, 20 years. Then uh, you have a server client system. Uh, then you put the server hosted somewhere, open a firewall, and that's cloud. It isn't. Yeah, and also if you look at the... Uh, uh, the cloud, uh, say, uh, as an in a in a enabler of great things like Netflix, or if any of one of you play the uh, popular games from Finland like Heyday or Clash of Clans, those wouldn't be possible without cloud. So, uh, regarding the sort of the benefits, how 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 tangible can you be in in the discussion around? Benefits and, and uh, you know we're discussing. Uh, I think Barry mentioned you know you have to have a clear idea of what you're aiming for. What, what are the typical benefits that customers are aiming for today with the cloud? Perhaps, perhaps speed. One, one, I think one one thing is speed. Well, um, I mean, you, you, got, you guys have uh, concrete I mean, Yeah, con yeah. You're, you're because uh, that, so. in, in traditional way, you you have to put manpower to get something work, and if you can buy it from the cloud, you you save a lot of lot of manpower and hours in, in your side. So I think speed is w one thing. Good. I was just going to say, I, I, th I think, again, there's a distinction here on <coughs> what the benefits could be and what people are actually looking for for today. A lot of the discussions that I've had with customers uh, tend to tend to focus on on one thing, and that's cost. They're looking at the dollar savings. And I have to say, in a way, the, the vendors are actually guilty uh, of, of this as well. We, we emphasize the, the actual fact that when you put things in the cloud, you know, you utilize Office 365, it'll cost you $22 or whatever um, a month. So we emphasize that, and, and that kind of leads people to think that that is the, the only benefit. Whereas, if you go back to the original question, there is a definition of the cloud by NIST, which is pretty much the one that, that Microsoft follows as well. And, and cost is only one thing there. Flexibility, the speed to market, uh, all those are, are, are benefits as well. But again, I, I think that's something that, that people should determine for, for themselves and organizations should determine for themselves. What is it that we want out of this? What is it that we're looking for in, in say, three to, uh, on a three to five year perspective? What do we want to get out of this? Is it less resources? Do we want to outsource, another buzzword, um, our, our admin and, and IT resources to somebody else? Or what is it that we want to do? You wanted to say. Yeah, I would say that a uh, few things that, uh, okay, that's, uh, probably typ typical enterprise talk, but cloud gives you the freedom and the speed of success or failure. If you can fail fast, that's cheaper for the organization rather than building something up and then figuring out that shit didn't, this didn't work. And it's also a possibility to explore, exploit new things. And if it works, 
great, let's build a new business around it. Or if it didn't work, let's wait for a few years, but we don't have any servers lying around somewhere getting dusty. Well, there, the, and, and, and benefits of the cloud, I, I honestly, there's a lot of different ways you can go. I certainly agree. We've A lot of us have talked about cost savings, and, and when you look at a finished service like Office 365, that's certainly one way to go. Another way to go is the fact that there's a huge, there can be a huge cost avoidance as well. So I'll give you a, a couple of examples. Um, one of them is a, is a, a restaurant in, in the United States, North America, called Outback Steakhouse. And last year they decided they wanted to have this big summer promotion. And th for the summer promotion, if you went to, um, through an online uh, site, they had an online promotion where basically you can go up there, click, and they would send you um, a coupon to get an awesome blossom appetizer. It's one of the things that they're very most popular for. And so they thought, well, we can go ahead and we can set up this and we can develop this application. Um, instead, they wrote the whole thing for Azure, the whole thing. And it took them about two and a half weeks. So they wrote this application, they published it, and they thought it would, you know, they'd probably get maybe tens of thousands. Well, everybody emailed their friends and they said, hey, free awesome blossoms at Outback. And all of a sudden they had hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and so they were, this was going to run from like, I think it was going to run for a few months, and they ended up cutting it back to like four to six weeks because they had so many people take them up on this offer. It was hugely successful. But what happened was when they deployed it, First of all, they, they didn't buy any hardware. They didn't buy any storage. They didn't buy any networking. They didn't buy any servers. They wrote an application using their MSDN account on Azure, and then they published it eventually. And when it needed, to, when it was published, guess what? They didn't have to do any capacity planning because Azure just went bloop, 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 and grew based on all the demand. And they didn't know how much demand there was going to be. And there was never a problem because Azure just fixed the capacity problem, capacity planning problem, which is another thing that the benefit of the cloud can be which is trying to do capacity planning in the first place, which is how do you know how much hardware do you need? And what ends up happening is usually people buy a whole bunch of hardware and over-provision it, and so you put this huge investment, this huge sunk cost in storage compute networking that may take you a while to recover. In this case, they stuck it up on Azure, it used all it needed, they let the promotion run, and guess when it was done? They just turned it off. That was it, gone. Now they have the code, if they want to do it ever again, they're ready to go. And hugely successful, so that was one. Um, another one is Xerox. So Xerox wanted to de develop a global printing service. They wanted to be able to say, if you're anywhere on Earth and you need to print something in a hurry, they want you to be able to go somewhere and you can be able to print out, you know, go, go quickly to get something printed. So Xerox thought about this and they said, you know, how do we do capacity planning for this? We can buy some servers and we can put them on, on each continent. We can try and figure out how much storage we're going to need, how much networking connectivity we need. They did the same thing. They did all this on Azure. They turned it on in North America. They tested it out. It worked. Guess what? They clicked publish, and that was available in Europe, in Asia Pacific, and South America. So the other thing it can really give you is that, that global scale because this is something that, again, you, you can do it yourself. But now you have to go and buy all that infrastructure, configure all that infrastructure, make it resilient, make it highly available, and you're gonna have to go put this all over the world and make this happen, where literally they didn't have to buy any servers, any storage, any networking, it's all consumption-based. So you know this, the time to market, the speed, the cost avoidance in terms of hardware, and be clear, for them, they, they actually said for them to even just to do this as a proof of concept around the world, they figured it was gonna at least take them a year they, they, they had the whole thing done in less than a year. Just to get all the hardware in all of these different places and provision ready to go, they were expecting it was going to take at least a year. So the, the benefits are manyfold, and certainly cost is one, but it really depends on you know, what you're planning, what your, what your use is for the cloud, and how you plan on deploying it, and what is the application you're, you're trying to, uh, one of, to one do. One of, the, one of the toughest questions that, uh, and, and uh, one of the questions that I got multiple times during the course of this Tech Days was, okay, how do I, how do I, Capacity planning is one thing, but how do I account for, I mean, how much will Azure cost me? Like in, in the case of the Outback, I've used the Outback mm -hmm. Steakhouse example multiple times in, uh, in different venues, but it's, it's uh, from, from uh, I mean, if you, if you think about it, hundreds of thousands of coupons. Uh, if you go too far and, and you've got millions and, and stuff like that, then and are you bankrupt? Do you, do you give away free stuff for, I mean, do you, what, what is the actual, actual business uh, impact, and, and the other side is, okay, how much is, if I design for a, for a social media type mm -hmm. of application, and, it, and it, 
exponentially grows, what is my, what is my bill for Azure? Yep. Well, you've got to have a business plan ahead of time. <laughs> Cloud doesn't solve you if you don't have a business plan. Uh, I would also add one of the kind of concrete, tangible benefits of the cloud is the security stuff that, you know, as a software vendor, when you're, when you're selling services from the cloud, the customers are asking for different kind of certifications. Do you have SAS, level two, whatever certificates and blah, blah, blah. And now you can basically push that burden to the big boy's shoulders and say that if those guys don't have it, you don't need it, <laughs> which helps quite a lot. And of course, enab enables a lot the kind of the smaller new technology companies to be able to compete against with the, with the old horses in the, on the track. Yeah. Uh, one thing about the cost savings, it would be great to have a lot of cost savings, but, but I think at the moment we have a problem that, that we are comparing apples and oranges. We, we are buying oranges, five oranges from the cloud, and we don't know how many apples we are saving from our own company. So we, we it's very pretty hard to say that we are saving some money when we are going to the cloud. And I, I, I think that, uh, at, at least in Finland, mo most of the companies are, are rather small and they are not going so direct and, and looking out their costs. So they, they don't know. IT costs something and it's only mm -hmm. a cost. It's, it's, it's not a service, it's a cost. And they try to cut out the cost, but they don't know where the money is going. And I think that's a big problem also. So uh, go going from the benefits to actually actually the design and, and thinking about you know what are the tools that you, what are the skill sets that we need and especially well we uh, Jaska touched on security um, in, in terms of cloud there's also uh, I mean you, you have to have some sort of disaster recovery plan you have to design for uh, you know high availability applications resiliency also in a cloud environment how do you, how do you how do you design for that. Johanny has a couple of thoughts, I see. He's thinking of a short <laughs> answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, One that won't run until 6 o'clock this evening. Uh. Yeah, well in, well, in most cases, you don't have to think about that at all. It's all taken care of for you, except for the ac application security. That you have to uh, be very careful, like you normally do. Disaster recovery uh, in normal operations uh, in any cloud environment it's probably safer than your own uh, closet where you're running the servers right now. It's always safer. And when you're building large-scale uh, systems, uh, if you look at what happened uh, during Christmas time, many of those large-scale systems were still not that resilient. Uh, like Netflix for, was down for uh, Christmas Eve, I think it was. Uh, for because one of the data centers went down where they host their application. They didn't uh, uh, design for data center re resiliency, but someday they might. But that's really, really, well, uh, rare occasions that, that those would happen. Last uh, summer in Finland, one of the local hosters lost 8,000 uh, websites that they couldn't restore for weeks. Um, well, that's a shitty situation. Did you say weeks? Weeks. They actually, wow. they lost some of them permanently. They couldn't Ooh. restore uh, them at a, all. It was, a, it, was a, it was a hardware failure, similar to a situation in Sweden where, where uh, there, was a, there was a storage issue and uh, Yeah, and stuff like that. you have to, shift happens. I don't use the actual word because this is recorded, but you know You've what I mean. You've already used it three times, so <laughs> I'm counting. Not the fourth time. So we, uh, need to, we need to bleep it. Of course, you have to think this, but how much you are thinking right now? And if you are not thinking, thinking it uh, when you are running stuff on premises, what happens when somebody uh, steals your servers? Where, where are your backups? What happens when your building uh, burns down? Where are your backups? How do you think that right now? If you are not thinking... Uh, that I have backup copies in somewhere else, then it's okay to push everything to the cloud and w uh, be happy. And when the disaster comes, start up a new company. Is that a failure, the fast failure loss? But yeah, that, that, uh, in a way it's a good point. Um, I, I don't think, even if you're designing for the cloud, no matter if you're looking at security, application security or service security or whatever, uh, there's only a certain amount of things that you can give 
to someone else, or to, uh, I, I'd be a bit hesitant to use the word outsource. Uh, but but th there's only a th there are still things that you need to think about yourself, uh, especially if you're you're an ISV and you're designing an application. But there's a lot of things in th that the cloud, any cloud service will provide you that will let you concentrate on on the things that are really your core business instead of, of thinking about the the all the the server security and 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 uh, continuity planning and whatever so th I think that's one of the the big benefits for the cloud especially for application application vendors but again here the, the, the points are somewhat different if you're an ISV and you think about the cloud. You think about different things. If you're a, a systems integrator and you're thinking about setting a private cloud service, you think about different things. If you're an enterprise, which that, that's mostly the discussions that I've had uh, are with enterprises, when they start thinking about where will they and, and what will they move to the cloud, it's a completely different discussion and the benefits are totally different for each one of these. And that's again something that you need to need to recognize and, and goes back to thinking about what is it that you really want to, as an organization, get out of the cloud. So uh, regarding the ISV discussion, uh, Sami, how, how have you guys, uh, how are you sort of designing uh, for resiliency and, and uh, like Ioanni said, you know, so that you don't have to start a new company next year? <laughs> well, uh what you have said is true. You need to take care of uh, the security on the application level. But uh, for us, it's easy to focus on that because the, all the, let's say, the uh, platform security and resiliency, high availability, those are more or less uh, made ready for us on the platform side. Uh, still, uh, there is just one, uh, I think that the security and uh, uh, it's also very much connected to the trust. And, uh, you still see, even though we know as an ISV that companies like Microsoft and others who've been putting billions of dollars to their cloud services, I think they have made their best to get the, all the platform security in place. There's something that none of us could ever, ever do. And uh, because it's also about trust, uh, we must uh, understand that uh, well, these guys are doing uh, everything for, for that because once you lose the trust, the, the, uh, then it's end of the business uh, for Microsoft's cloud or uh, any other vendor's cloud. But still, there is trust issues with the customers, uh, think, thinking about uh, where our data is stored. Uh, is it still secure because it's not in our basement? Uh, can we be sure that it's everything in place? and uh, even though for an ISV, this is kind of self-evident that, or, or, or at least we trust that it, uh, uh, it is secure. Uh, there's still a lot of evangelism and uh, communications that need to be done for the end customer still. What has been interesting is I've noticed that the conversation when it comes to security is starting to shift. Yeah. I know when we first started talking about cloud a few years ago and it was coming up, there was an absolute almost paranoia from people that was like, no way, I'm never putting anything up there. You know, it's one of those, if I can't, you know, hug the surfer myself, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to trust it. And we're seeing that far less. In fact, talk to CEOs who've told me point blank, I'm confident you guys are way more secure than what I'm doing. You know, and, you know, we, you know, we realize you've been doing this, you, 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 you built this. You know, we, we, we're doing our best, but we understand that, you know, Microsoft, this is just how you do business, and we're, we're more and more comfortable every day. I, th I think there was a recent Gartner announcement at the Gartner conference where, where basically Gartner was saying that if you're a chief security officer and you're paranoid about the cloud, you're not going to have a job next year. Yeah. So, uh, so that's, uh, if, you, if you don't start to look at, look at the cloud in a, in a trustworthy way and, and, and look at what the vendors are doing, then uh, that's, uh, I mean, like, mm -hmm. uh, like Jeff said, I mean, I, I've noticed the same thing. It's uh, the, the security discussion is not as not as uh, prevalent as it was. Yeah, a the, years the ago. conversation shift shifted really from security now to, you know, okay, tell me more about, you know, what are the performance guarantees and what what are those types of things? How do SLAs I do application and management and SLAs types of things? That's right. how the conversation switched. 
uh, I think security used to be firewall. I think this was firewall, which was protecting our, our infrastructure. And, and, and when we are putting things to cloud, we are thinking, oh, they are outside of our firewall. But the problem was the firewall is it's, it's full of holes today. So it's better to secure the data instead of our infrastructure. So I would, uh, one interesting, in, interesting customer case, uh, a gentleman in the audience, uh, my colleague Antti, Antti can uh, talk about it. If, if anybody wants to wants to have a chat, but uh, for instance, FinPro, uh, which was one of the wor first uh, Windows 7 and and uh, uh, R2 deployments, um, 2008 R2 uh, direct access customers in, in Finland, they've got 61 sites uh, all around the world, about 350 uh, uh, st strategy consultants for business uh, business consultants basically. Uh, they're they're currently I think the uh, current schedule was that they're they're getting rid of all of their branch office network infrastructure by midsummer. Yeah. So by midsummer, they will not have. They will save about a hundred thousand euros per year on network gear. They're going full blown direct access, public internet. The internet is their network, and this is going to happen by by midsummer. So um, they've been so so uh, so pleased with uh, with direct access, and they've got. Uh, We've got a current uh, 2012 uh, upgrade going on and stuff like that. So, again, you know, if you're if you're stuck on stuck, uh, if 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 you can't wrap your head around the firewall, and, and can't think outside of it, you know, the, the world changes around you. So, uh, I guess uh, we'll we'll start closing up. But um, uh, before we go go to the sort of the trends, uh, one of the cost discussions is, uh, you know, do I build my own? Uh, do I do I buy it from somewhere? ready-made or do I rent the stuff what's uh, what's yes your take on it yes <laughs> yeah, yes uh, we will. answer uh, consul all sounds good consul <laughs> consulting <laughs> services answer oh no sorry that no, was no, that, that, that would be that all maybe depends. That, that, that's it depends yeah mm. it really goes back to your business needs again um, I'm gonna use on Rigo here as a, a perfect example um, one of the biggest challenges I've seen in one of the biggest holes I've seen for the last 10 years is people aren't doing enough from a management standpoint. Just just flat out across the board. It doesn't matter. It seems just it's everybody's doing this. Everyone sets up a workload and then never manages it and never monitors it. And you don't know, is it really performing well? Is it meeting my business requirements? Could it be performing better? And, you know, quickest way to do it is set up System Center and start monitoring those applications using all the tools that we provide. And a quick way to do that would be use something like Onrigo, which is management as a service, to start doing that immediately and finding out, hey, you know, use the, take advantage of the agility of cloud, and you could have System Center set up and immediately helping you troubleshoot and get you better performance in your infrastructure. If you're a large enterprise and you decide, you know what, um, I want to become my own you know, infrastructure as a service provider within my company, I'm certainly starting to see more and more of that within enterprises as well. And if that's the case, then maybe it is a build component. Um, but also, there's, there's plenty of reasons why you're going to you know, use the public cloud and take advantage of that, again, if you want to achieve scale around the world. So it's going to depend on what are the requirements that you're, you're looking to fulfill and make, make what is, what, what's business sense for you. That topic covered? The answer is yes. 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 yes, it's a good answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the yes, man. Um, finally, cloud trends. Mm. Big, big sort of payload in your lap right now. I mean, uh, what, what do you see? Well, what's, uh, what's if, if I invest in, if I'm a customer and I'm, I, I look at all the vendors, all the players, everything that's out there, who do I invest in and, and, and what's my roadmap for the next three to five years? Tommy. Well, I don't know about what the roadmap should be for the next five or ten years, uh, but uh, one thing that's been, uh, uh, the topic was discussed a little bit earlier was that the cloud is a trend now. Uh, it's a buzzword. Like ten years ago, everybody was aiming for service-oriented architecture, we, and everybody was doing service-oriented architectures, even though no one knew actually what it is. And today you have like dozens of clouds or uh, definitions for, for cloud, but uh, I don't know about trends, but uh, you have to remember where this all started, like 50 or 60 years ago. 
And I think that at that point, the computing was a utility. Like it, it, it was getting from the socket. When you, when you had like a couple of dozens of computers worldwide, I think that the business at that point was, or the business idea at that point was to have a pay-as-you-go computing, which you can, you can log into a computer next to you, which might be hundreds of kilometers away, and pay, pay for the hour. And uh, I think that we are now getting into the same place, and we are discussing about exactly the same things that uh, were existing already in 50s or 60s. So I'm not going to tell anything about the next five or 10 years, because I know that it's a cycle, and you never know where you end up. So you're, you're saying that we're going, going to go back to green screens or something like that? <laughs> oh, please no. <laughs> Oh, please. Which one is better, green screen or blue screen? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there's uh, some of the guys on the client track, they can, they can change that blue screen into a red screen on the oh, fly. Yeah. So. I think uh, the trends in the cloud that everybody uh, will have the opportunity to op observe is that small, fast, nimble vendors, especially application vendors, will start eating uh, the stagnant ISVs away from this market. And if you look at Microsoft, uh, we are eating ourselves uh, currently by offering Office 365 uh, instead of selling exchange servers uh, to people on premises. The reason why we are doing this, that if we are not doing that, somebody is going to do it to us. So uh, if you are an ISV and you are selling soft packaged software, you should start st thinking how to move to more services or service-based uh, software delivery to your uh, customers because if you're not doing it somebody else will do it and your customer base will uh, slowly start to decay i think Jaska, you you're, you're doing this right now yes and i agree totally here with Johanny, and i think that's exactly what we are seeing and I, what what i've seen is this kind of you know purchasing behavior from the customers the expectation level of the user experience and it's starting to reflect so heavily into the into the offerings model how do you offer the software or application whatever you sell to them and like you said if you don't do it somebody else will eat your business away so of course it's a bit tricky and you know there's some uh, let's say slowering elements for some companies because you have a lot of on-premise customers for example the migrations might be difficult to do but uh, at some point you just have to start planning how to do the transformation B bite the bullet and feel the pain sorry bite the bullet and feel the pain yes and that's, like, if that's the view from, from an ISV or, a, or an application provider, then what does that, because that, that will mean something to the enterprises or organizations that actually buy the services. And what, what I think it will mean to them is that it, it's not a question anymore of uh, will I go on-premise or will I go private or will I go public. I bet most of the the organizations in the future will actually have services that are, are, are maybe sitting in, in, in any one of these. And that's something that, so hybrid is, is I, I think, the, the, the big trend that people need to be, be ready for because that will mean that your, your IT environment will need to have certain capabilities that will allow them to go hybrid. Your identities need to be hybrid capable you need to be federated, blah, 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 all the technology stuff behind that. You need to be able to somehow manage and monitor that type of an, uh, of an environment. So, so I think if there's one thing that, that enterprises specifically need to look at now is they need to make sure that their IT environment has the capabilities that will let them go and pick and choose things from different ISV vendors and and, and live with that environment. Yeah, and one uh, thought, food for thought for you all. Did you know that time travel is possible? The physicists have already uh, proven that uh, theory. Now it's just an engineering problem. This is the same thing with cloud. It's just an engineering pro problem, human engineering and some other engineering problems, but it's possible. Probably one more thing. Uh, when I look at the cloud trends, hybrid, the, 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 the growth of hybrid is, is, is very much 
uh, underway right now. The biggest challenge is, is very much the networks. Um, it's been interesting just talking with people the last few months. Everyone has a networking problem. It's really, it, everybody, everybody says the same thing. Met with a customer today, in fact, and one of the things he said was, I have hundreds of VLANs. I hear this all the time. Um, it's truly amazing to hear how big the whole logical segmentation of networking is. Um, it's a mess. Um, we're, we're, de we're using technology that was, you know, in its prime back in 1995, and it doesn't scale today. Um, VLANs were never designed to do uh, the amount of segmentation that we're, we're trying to do today, and it's only getting worse um, as we start to move into these hybrid cloud environments. So definitely a trend is, is network virtualization and software-defined networking. Um, we've got to get our networks under better management, under better control. I also think we're going to start to look and see some big changes in storage. Um, one of the, th the things that I've been watching and I'm just so excited is every day is SSD. SSD to me is like the Christmas I've been waiting for because we've been limited to the fact that disks have had rotating media and a, and a head that goes across and finds data on a platter for you know 50 plus years now. And we're finally getting to a point where SSDs are, are changing the, 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 the performance characteristics of our, of our underlying servers, which allow us to deliver that big data that's living up in the cloud. So I think that's gonna, it's gonna change and we're gonna see hopefully the cost economics of storage drop. Because right now, uh, one of the biggest challenges of deploying um, and creating your own cloud is the cost of storage. And so that's something we definitely need to look at and I think you're gonna see a, a, a big change and a, a lot of serious innovation going on in storage in, uh, in, in the very, very near future. So gentlemen, any, uh, to wrap things up, any, any final comments, thoughts from your side? What do you, what do you want, uh, everybody's here to, you know, grab something along with them and, and, and do something tomorrow. Uh, immediately, I, some, some I, actionable items. I, I got my one big thing. I, I'm, first of all, thanks everyone. Again, the Tech Days has been wonderful. This is my first time in Finland. I've just had a, a great time uh, here. My one big thing I would tell everyone is please, if you haven't installed Server 2012 and if you haven't started looking at System Center 2012 SP1, there is absolutely no better time than right now. Um, it's, it's, we, we are seeing people you know, this is, we're seeing already incredibly fast adoption of Server 2012 already. Even, you know, it's been in the, less, in the market in near, less than six months. We're, we're talking with folks that got it in production already. So please, there's no time like the present because there is so much to take advantage of, whether it's virtualization, whether it's storage virtualization, networking, Active Directory, PowerShell automation, et cetera. Um, there's a tremendous amount there, and of course, System Center lights up all of these features like network virtualization, for example, service templating, and all of these things that allow you to do and be, and, and be successful to provide uh, cloud services. And if not, take a look at uh, Onrigo and, and take a look at System Center and management as a service because you can start taking advantage of it now. So there's no reason to not be using System Center to manage your infrastructure. Back up. Sort of baton in there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sami, final thoughts? Final thoughts, maybe, I think two things, hybrid environments and best of breed applications. I don't know what, what, what um, that should be, be supposed to mean as an action point, but that's where I believe. Chal it. Challenge your current vendors, right? Go. That's true, that's true. Look uh, at what you have and look at what you could do differently. And start kicking some Azure cloud tires. Yeah. Better? Absolutely. I, I think two things. I, I think, first of all, you know, you should go back and, and think about cloud and what is it that I want to achieve? Benefits. What are the benefits that I'm looking for? And the second thing I would say is, is think out of the box. There's a lot of technology stuff that, that we and other vendors will, will, will give you. Uh, but think out of the box. Kick things out of your, your data center, kick things out of your mind. Forget how things used to be done before. Because the cloud is a true, it is a paradigm shift. It is a shift in, in the way that we actually provide and utilize IT. And really reaping the benefits out of that will, will require us to, to forget how things were done previously and, and think out of the box. And finally, Aska. Well, I would say from again from the from the software vendors' perspective that uh, 
just need to be kind of agile and you have to think about this B2C world coming to B2B and you have to be able to, you know, develop the services and, you know, the, the, the offering all the time. If you're stuck into one version for one year, you know, somebody else will take that customer away from you. you want to and uh, almost the final words, be the startup inside your own company. Start experimenting. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, any uh, questions from the audience? It's late in the afternoon. Kalle. Hold on. Throw him the cube. Okay, hello. Rasen uh, from Aroises, Finland. Um, I'd like to ask soon what's going to be happen in the future. Because now we say the first time we also start to keep the service for consumer. Do we see in the near future BDI example from the cloud? From the cloud. Oh, this, this, is, a, this is a private cloud. I, I, I think we don't need any any desktop from the cloud because the applications are. Yeah, I mean, look, 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 look at Surface, all, look all at the Windows 8 appliance apps we have. <laughs> I mean, we do you need what, what? Do you need VDI? We, we we've had a lot of discussion with Jeff uh, during the course of the weekend and and uh, tech days around VDI. I think, I think, first of all, we certainly embrace the fact that we know what people expect to be able to get their applications and services on any types of devices out there. Um, that's very much part of the, you know, I, I, I really don't like consumerization of IT. It's more about, to me, it's about, you know, customer focused or user focused, um, um, uh, you know, getting their data in that way. Um, when it comes to VDI, to me, I always look at it as what is it you're really trying to accomplish? I want to be able to get uh, that application or, or my data from anywhere else. There's a lot of different ways you can do it um, in, in the cloud. If you want to do it on premises, and certainly you can set up your own VDI infrastructure. In fact, a lot of people don't realize this, but in server 2012, we actually include full VDI in the box. Um, I have to admit, we've done a really poor job in telling people. It's actually in the box right now. Say you had a, an office, 500 people, and you wanted to do VDI. It's actually all built into server 2012. We'll create golden images, we'll update the images, we'll do master images. We actually have it all in 2012, and we actually made a whole bunch of investments in terms of VDI, in terms of the remote FX protocol, and making sure that we've got multi-touch support in, our, in the remote FX protocol. Um, we've just been so busy talking about so many other things that we just haven't had a chance to spend some time talking about it. But we have made a huge investment there in server 2012. Um, and so for people that want to take advantage of it, again, you need to take a look because there's, there's actually a, a huge treasure trove built into 2012 specifically around VDI, both pooled and personalized deployments of VDI. Did that answer the question? We can have, we can take this offline. Any other ones? Keep it. <coughs> okay. Uh, in the beginning of, uh, year 2000, I guess, uh, the talk about if Microsoft was enterprise ready stopped. Uh, before that, we had Windows NT and uh, big companies were sort of thinking if Windows NT for good for really large enterprises, enterprises stopped then. Now we ourselves think about how uh, hoster ready Microsoft is, which means you have uh, very nice things, uh, claims-based uh, things uh, from the Office 365. You have multi-tenant active directories, which I sometimes think as uh, loosely coupled active directory, which means I can join there and get the services which I want without being sort of totally uh, consumed by uh, the uh, uh, ADs. So, <coughs> um, and to be able to with system center take care uh, of uh, hundreds or thousands of companies uh, with one setup just uh, to let the tenants have gateway service, servers, so to say, uh, to connect to the specific customers. So uh, this was a comment, but also a question, of course, to Jeff. Uh, uh, what do you think about the sort of host ready future of private clouds and Microsoft technologies. I was wondering where you're going with that when you started with NT. I was like, wow, we're going in the <laughs> Wayback Machine here. Okay, okay, now I get it. Uh, no, you, I, I, I totally, yeah, totally understand that. Um, 
how, how was a service provider going to integrate with System Center? In fact, this is an area we, we listen very carefully and closely to our service provider partners on. Um, it's taking a bit of time, but we're, we're getting there. Well, it's, it's taken some time. In fact, I'll admit we have, um, we have an annual um, a conference with, um, with service providers. Um, we invite them every year um, to come to Redmond, and, and they come annually, and we sit down and we chat. And, and it's been very interesting because for the last few years, they'd, they would come. We'd all sit down, and I'd sit in a room, and I'd say, what's on your mind? And they start yelling at me. And it's been fun. I, and I go every year, and they sit down, and they start yelling at me. And they say, you know what, Jeff? We think what you're doing in server and system center is great for enterprises, but what are you doing for hosters? And been taking lots of notes, and I say, yes, I hear you. I promise we, we are listening. We're, we're working on it. And this year, I went and sat down, and, and I was waiting for the conversation. And I was in this huge room, and I said, okay, everybody, let's, let's hear it. What are your gripes? And the room was dead silent. I said, no, no, wh I'm waiting. I, I come here every year for you to yell at me. I'm waiting. Start yelling at me. And no one could say anything. And finally, a gentleman said, look, I have to admit, we've been yelling at you the last few years, and we haven't found it yet. We've been using Server 2012, and it looks like you nailed it. It's got everything we're looking for. We look at System Center 2012 SP1, and it looks like you really nailed it this time. It's got the things that we need that are critical. And one of those is you know, the REST APIs and the work that we've done in Service Provider Foundation to make sure that a service, uh, a service provider that wants to integrate their custom portals, their custom infrastructure, because all of these service providers, everyone's, you know, they have their own secret sauce and everyone's building their own unique uh, value in, in, their, in, their, in their IT organization, but they still want to be able to plug this in the system and take, it, and take advantage of the things that we've done in System Center because we aggregate things from all of our Hyper-V hosts or we can aggregate things from application management, things like that. So can we plug that in to a service provider? And so we've done a huge amount of that work already. Uh, we had a project called Catal. I can never remember the official name uh, of it. Service, service pro uh, it's, it's Azure. Windows Azure Services for Windows Server. Thank you. That rolls right off the tongue there. Um, and our goal it's is. marketing to, for you. Well, you know, uh, our goal here. It's a free download. Is, it is a free download. And our goal is to make it easy for partners to plug into System Center, take advantage of those REST APIs. The other thing we're thinking about is um, providing a consistent interface. So one of the challenges is everybody has their own portal, and everyone's working on their own portal. And you go to portal one, portal two, portal three, and all of a sudden I've got portals everywhere, um, and getting portal fatigue. So is there a way that we can make these start to look similar and give them a nice, clean, modern look and feel that you can plug into? And that's actually you know some of the things we're doing there. But yes, we very much we've made huge investments in server with multi-tenancy. Again, network virtualization is all about hosters. The quality of service capabilities we put in Hyper V are all about hosters. And there's a handful of features that are in, in server and in system center that I'll, that are absolutely 100% almost completely for hosters. And we're not done yet. We're actually spending a lot more time very much focused on making sure that our service provider partners have everything they need and the things that we've learned from Azure we're driving into Windows Server and System Center. One, one sales pitch, TechEd. Go to TechEd. I love that throwing mic thing. That's so cool. Good, <coughs> good finish, finish innovation is what that is. Jeez. Um, <clears throat> do you see uh, the Active Directory uh, of uh, Windows Azure sort of becoming more visible in Office 365, sort of how do you think that would evolve in uh, uh, Office 365? Because I have a HMC, hosted machine collaboration background and sort of, uh, again, multi-tenancy and active directory. How could that show up in uh, Office 365? So I have to admit, that's that's a little outside of my sphere. I don't spend a ton of time sitting with those guys. So I, and, it, and, I don't, it's, I, and it's bad marketing because Windows Azure Active Directory is not, you know, Active Directory like you yes. think about Active Directory. But uh, I, I'm going to make a supposition for just a moment. I certainly expect to see more integration there. Um, the fact that we put Active Directory up in Azure is something that people are applauding very loudly because you want to take your identity with you to the cloud. You want that single sign-on experience, but you you know you want to make sure it's secure. But you want to be able to take that up to you know where and have it follow you when you go to the cloud. So you have you know claims base and file classification. All of those fantastic things can go with you um, into the so cloud. So Windows Azure Active Directory is basically the Office 365 <coughs> Directory Sync stuff 
uh, just available for any application or any, any anything that you want to use it for. So that's that's sort of the, in, in one sentence, what, what Azure Active Directory is. Any other ones? One final question. Uh, <laughs> if, if nobody else, uh, okay. Sorry. Uh, what about joining workstation to the cloud? So the, uh, I have, for example, 50 employees, and I don't put up uh, my own servers at all. I just have 50 workstations which I would join to the cloud and have some kind of group policies and other policies and uh, workstation monitoring and that stuff. In June. Using certificates. You're talking about, it sounds like, yeah, it sounds like exactly like Intune. You're talking about client and endpoint management is what you're talking about, right? Yeah. And these aren't domain joined, right? Probably not. So, yeah. In, Intune. Yeah. Intune. Or, or Pecos. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yes, the, cer certainly there's a, there will be a variety of different solutions out there, but, you know, we understand, and, and the goal of Intune, in case you don't know this, is to be able to make sure that it, it can manage all different types of endpoints as well. So it's not just, you know, Windows devices, but it's, you know. It's Android. It's Android, Apple. iPhone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry, well, what's that? Yes. Well, that, that, that's, that's what JP was talking about. I mean, just using directory sync in the background, and it's already there. I mean, it's a, if, if you look back at uh, another. Uh, well, that's, well, we, we'll, we'll take that offline. I have well, a you need AD for single sign-on anyway. Where, I mean, wherever you that, can put that you, you can put it in Azure. I, I think that the standard answer to that would be we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> that, it what, it's inevitable accent. that, that, that that's going to, it's the same as if you look at, at the Azure directory and you look at the Office 365 directory, it's inevitable that these two will be not necessarily it's the same directory it's, it's the same stuff it's similar to look at look at it's the same stuff with Avenade from from well, November it's it we, we had demos of that I've been working it's with the same Oscar. stuff <laughs> I, I, actually, actually we are doing that at yeah. the moment so we are thinking because you don't have your own service we are giving those to you and and we are building that active directory in the cloud in our place so you then you have Active Directory, but uh, no. Okay, we got we, without Active Directory. I think Sounds like we got a number of different ways we can solve yeah, this problem. Exactly. But yes, <laughs> yeah, we, we can whiteboard it. Uh, one, one question from JP that he didn't get to ask was, where did the Windows Azure appliance go? Where is the Windows Azure appliance? Well, Windows Azure appliance needs people, processes, and technology, and we do have the uh, all free, but you don't. And that's a problem. Nobody wants to buy Azure cluster, which is at least 1,000 servers, and then you need a storage cluster, which is another 1,000 servers, uh, when you, before you start uh, deploying your own applications. And currently, uh, we do have one customer. Uh, I think it was I eBay. Think, I think there's actually, honestly, I think there's a different question. Why do you care? I, I've seen it. I've seen it come. It seems to come up like every six months or every year. Someone asks me, "Hey, where did that go?" Why, why, why do, do, do you really want to set up a, you know, do you really want this or do you want this just sitting up in the cloud already for you? I'm, I'm kind of curious, the question is why? Just, just as a tip, David Lowe, who was here doing the keynote demos for the Windows Server 2008 launch, he was actually the program manager for Windows Azure Appliance later on. He's gone to other things. <laughs> he's, he's doing business, he's doing partner business management at a global scale for, for Windows Azure partners, so. Perhaps, uh, I don't know, we might want to cut, cut that out of the uh, recording, but uh, <laughs> that might answer a couple of things. I appreciate it. I think uh, uh, well, we thank you for attending Tech Days. Uh, for, uh, from, from my point of view, it was a great, uh, great event. Uh, please make sure that all the server guys get five stars because we want to kill all the client guys in terms of feedback. So, uh, so we want to be the best, best uh, track overall, so make, make sure we, we, we get the best, best feedback from you guys. Uh, applause for the panelists. Thank you and have a safe trip home. <laughs>